Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. I'd like to welcome you to this special edition of the Misquoting Jesus podcast. Uh, this time, I will not be uh, interviewed uh, by Megan Lewis. Uh, I am going to be uh, doing the interviewing myself. And as it turns out, I'm going to be interviewing Megan Lewis's uh, husband, <laughs> Josh Bowen. <laughs> and so he's he, uh, he, like Megan, is an expert on the ancient Near East. And he's especially an expert on slavery in the ancient world, in, including, uh, most importantly for us, slavery in the Bible. And he's written two books on this. And so uh, we're going to be doing an episode on that, which I'm, I'm really, really interested in for a number of reasons. And as you'll see, it is a very, very interesting topic. Uh, before we get to that, I do want to uh, make a special announcement of, uh, of something that's, that's coming up uh, very, uh, very soon. We have a... Um, we have a course uh, that I'm going to be doing um, this coming weekend on uh, July uh, 23rd, uh, Sunday, July 23rd. It'll be a four lecture course that is called Why I Am Not a Christian, How Leaving the Faith Led to a Life of More Meaning and Purpose. Um, this is a uh, this will be a personal autobiographical course that will also though be talking about uh, problems with the New Testament, um, contradictions and discrepancies and that kind of thing that you've that some of you have heard me talk about uh, before. But it's going to be talking about how these uh, these such issues. Uh, were an issue for me in terms of my personal faith. And so this will be about uh, how I moved away from being an evangelical Christian to being a, a liberal Christian for a long time. And then unrelated to my uh, study of the Bible, but my sort of study of reality, <laughs> how, I, uh, how I left the faith altogether and became an agnostic uh, atheist some 30 years ago. And I'll be talking about the emotional struggles that that entails and the social difficulties that it creates. Uh, I know a lot of people who uh, who follow uh, my uh, my podcast and my blog and other, my writings uh, know that I left the faith, uh, but I'll be telling some stories that I've never told before, sharing some anecdotes. I'll be talking about information I've never sh shared publicly before. Uh, and it won't just be about the Bible, but it'll certainly be about the Bible. And it'll also be about my personal life, but it won't be just about my personal life. And it will end up talking about the difficulties people have leaving the faith and why, for me at least, it's been a very good thing indeed. Um, I'm not going to be trying to convert anybody or uh, deconvert anybody. I'm simply going to lay out my personal story and the way I the way I see it, as a way possibly of helping other people uh, in their in their own journeys, whether they're people of faith or people leaving the faith or people who don't have faith. Uh, so anyway, that'll be that'll be uh, on the Sunday, July 23rd. If you want to find out about it, go to bartermancom slash life after faith, and. Um, the nice thing about this one is it's a uh, it's free. <laughs> this one uh, there's no charge. Uh, it'll be four lectures that are probably I don't know 40 minutes long or so, followed by a lengthy Q and A. Uh, and so uh, we'll be publishing it as a course uh, eventually. But if you come live to it uh, on Sunday, then you will uh, be able to uh, participate in the Q and A, and you'll you'll hear me give it. So uh, if you're interested, just go to bartermancom slash life after faith. Uh, look it up and I, I hope you can come. Okay. Uh, so for uh, this uh, particular podcast, however, it's not about why uh, I left the faith. It's about slavery uh, in the Bible with my special guest, uh, Joshua Bowen. So uh, let me first say a few things about Joshua so you see what his uh, credentials are because they are in fact uh, quite substantial. Uh, Josh got his PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies at uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, University. If, you, uh, if you're familiar with the field of ancient Near Eastern studies, you know this is, this is uh, one of the truly premier uh, programs uh, in, in the known universe. He also did his, uh, he also did his, MA, uh, his MA there after, after doing uh, a THM at a, at a Christian uh, seminary, the Capital Bible Seminary. Uh, Josh has been a Fulbright scholar uh, 2014 to 15, he studied uh, in Germany 
uh, for a year at the University of Tübingen, which is a very uh, famous uh, university for uh, all of us who are uh, biblical scholars. And he also uh, uh, received a scholarship from the German Academic Exchange Service. Uh, he has been an instructor at Johns Hopkins, teaching things such as the language of uh, ancient Sumerian and the, langu the Akkadian uh, language. He's also been a, uh, an archaeologist uh, working uh, in, uh, in Syria. So uh, he is, uh, he's known to the ancient Near Eastern community because he and Megan run this, uh, this uh, podcast, uh, Digital Hammurabi. And um, he's very active with that, and he's published a number of uh, works with that, including a two-volume atheist handbook to the Old Testament and a book that turned out to be somewhat controversial, Did the Old Testament Endorse Slavery? <laughs> okay, uh, so we, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, that and uh, such things uh, here on, our, uh, on, our, on the podcast. So welcome, Josh. Glad to see uh you. Uh, absolute pleasure. Good to good to finally get to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you know, uh, people who who listen to and watch this podcast are always commenting about how amazing uh, Megan is, and now they they get to see who's the guy who ended up with her. <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, done, right, right the, the very very lucky man. <laughs> well done, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Josh, maybe uh, maybe for some listeners, we should introduce what we mean by the ancient Near East, because uh, this is not this is common parlance for. Uh, for us, but it's not something that uh, probably people talk about in the checkout line at the grocery store. So can right. you just say say kind of what, what the field is? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, Assyriology um, studies this this area uh, of ancient Mesopotamia, Syria, you know, this this uh, land in between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and then you know, the, the region that surrounds that extends down to Egypt in the southwest, in Anatolia up in the in the northwest. And over to Iran, and it, it generally, um, you know, covers the time period of maybe 3,300 down to the time of Alexander the Great, right around 300. Uh, so that three, three millennia time span, which is wonderful and terrible, uh, because we have so much source material from that period that it's it's hard to get your hands around all of it. But uh, it's 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 a really interesting field. And of course, it yeah, informs so the Bible quite a bit. So. Right. So, so it's not, um, so it's, it's closely related to biblical studies, but it's dealing with mainly cultures kind of in the environment. Uh, for, for people who are more familiar with the Bible, this would be cultures around the Bible. But of course, when somebody's studying that material, the ancient Near East, they're not, it's not that they're trying to just kind of find the back, background to the Bible. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So you, you actually have to learn these other languages, Sumerian, Akkadian, and are there other languages too that people like you do? Yeah. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, Ugaritic is something that a lot of people uh, end up specializing in that do that sort of crossover between the Bible and the ancient Near East. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I, you know, people can study Hittite or, of course, Egyptian, uh, the various dialects of Egyptian. But <laughs> okay. I never really uh, I never really yeah. had the time to get into Egyptian. But yeah, OK, it's a complicated business. But I mean, I think uh, I think anybody who just even bothers to study this stuff, uh, we, we add another 50 points to their IQ no matter what. <laughs> I mean, because this is not like <laughs> this is not easy stuff. So so when you say there's a lot of source material, um, so there are a lot of written texts. Um, these have mainly been discovered in the modern period. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, the last several centuries, uh, probably 500,000 cuneiform tablets and fragments have come to light. Huh. Um, are all these languages in cuneiform? Uh, yeah, um, you know the the ones certainly the ones that I study are, um, and Ugaritic is that nice crossover because it it's a it's an alphabetic language in a cuneiform script. Yeah, uh, whereas most you know, cuneiform is, is syllabic. Yeah, oh, syllabic. Uh, so uh, meaning that you, so these are, this is the thing where you got these kind of wedges that look like kind of triangles, right? <laughs> That's right. Like a chicken did a dance over the clay or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, right, right. And so, but syllabic means that the, the these these very symbols represent syllables rather than yeah. letters. Is that it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. instead of it being just a strictly alphabetic language, it's 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 vastly more complicated. Um, so, so you know the the signs can be 
consonant vowel consonant or consonant vowel or vowel consonant and then each sign can represent you know three or five sometimes more uh, okay. of those individual values but they can also stand as the words themselves uh, it's okay yeah no, okay yeah well yeah it's fun yeah okay i'm glad to hear it's fun uh, i've always been kind of fond of alphabets myself and so those are most of my languages so uh, all right me. so okay so josh we, we, we want to talk specifically about some of the content of what you find in these in these texts and obviously we're not even going to scratch the surface on this thing but i want to i do want to focus on an area of your expertise which is uh slavery uh in the ancient world and we uh, we, I, I do want to know about other cultures around uh, Israel, but since this is really our, our focus for most of our audience is more biblical studies, I want to get to the Hebrew Bible than than even to the, even to the New Testament. Um, uh, so let's let's just start with that and just talk about slavery uh, in antiquity. And I, I wonder if you could just tell us. I mean, it sounds kind of basic, but it turns out there are debates even what. The term slave means uh, uh and among scholars i mean i know scholars who have a debate in the in early christianity at least. can you just do you have a kind of just a working definition of what you mean by slave as opposed to like other kinds of categories that are comparable yeah so generally like the the, the complexity with the the like the akkadian term wardu or the you know the the term in the hebrew bible um eved is that it's it's used to cover sort of a broad range uh, of, of it can be applied to different individuals. So a king can be a slave, right? A person that's actually owned by another person can be a slave. And so it just depends on the meaning. It's obviously driven by the context. So when we're talking about slavery in this sense of, you know, slavery proper, like, you know, debt slavery, chattel slavery, sex slavery, um, you know, we're talking about someone who is owned uh, essentially by another, either temporarily or permanently, and the, the owner, the master, benefits from the labor um, uh, of the of the owned individual. So, okay. I mean, like at a basic form. So, in in that sort of more narrow sense, uh, like a king would not, you know, who's called the slave of another king would not necessarily fall into that category because it's it's being used a little more broadly. Yes, um, right. And so, uh, okay. So, but it basically, I mean, the 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 technical definition is somebody's literally owned uh, by by another person. And so, it doesn't. It might be used metaphorically for a king, maybe, or yeah. like, uh, or it might be. But they're also. It's not the same as having like a like a a servant. You know, somebody who you, that you you pay. Um, That's right. Although I guess slaves get paid in the sense they get fed, right? <laughs> and they, uh, <laughs> yeah. If we want to, yeah, I guess if we want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. later in the later period, of course, you know, in, Ro in Ro Roman times, in the Roman Empire, slaves often did get paid mm -hmm. and could buy their own freedom. So, but but at least in the ancient Near East, these are people who are owned and required to do what their masters say. Yeah, and the. And so it's kind of an investment for the master, right? The master, I mean, the master has a vested interest in making sure the slave doesn't starve to death sure. uh, because, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so, um, and in these texts that you work with, so let's say, uh, I don't know how far back you go. Do you go back 3000 to 3000 BCE yourself? Yeah, I mean, we we generally uh, start, to, start to deal with the legal um, aspects of slavery uh, I mean, you, you, we can definitely go back into the early third millennium. You have your first sort of law collection right at the end of the third millennium. But we, we certainly have texts that describe uh, these types of transactions that go back into the third millennium. OK, so are the are these texts? Um, so it sounds like you're saying they aren't really like narrative texts telling stories about slaves or you, you deal mainly with legal texts that have like rules about uh, buying slaves or keeping slaves or. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about you know working with the cuneiform record is that we have it all oh. um and so when scholars uh you know legal scholars attempt to get into any any particular um aspect of, of the legal system be it about you know laws on adultery or laws on rape or laws on slavery uh it's it's there's not a, a small amount uh, of evidence that they have to sift through which is wonderful um so they'll usually start with uh, things like law collections, these, you know, long lists of if this happens, then do this. Mm -hmm. If this happens, then do that. Um, but we also have actual uh, contracts. We have court cases. 
Um, and then as it starts to expand out, you have, you know, you can glean information just like with the Bible, you can glean information from like pedagogical texts or Proverbs. Uh, you can get it from narratives. So if you read like second Kings four, one, you can see, uh, mm -hmm. a, a woman, uh, complaining that, uh, her two children are getting ready to be taken as debt slaves by the creditor. Um, and so while that's not a legal text, it certainly is informing the practice, uh, at least in that context. So, yeah, yeah that, we have a lot of information to sift through, I guess. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, you know, so I suppose people just kind of plumb through these texts and they read them. And if they're paying careful attention, then they just note where the slaves are talked about. And are there like compilations that, that uh, like, can, can somebody... Can somebody who, who's not going to go out and learn cuneiform, are there like collections of texts that talk about slaves in uh, the ancient Near East? Yeah, there are several people that have, have written about this. Of course, probably the easiest place to go is um, Martha Roth has uh, uh, a text called like Law Collections from Asia Minor, where she brings back, and she's specifically dealing with these, these actual long lists of laws hmm. uh, from all the different periods, and she has them in uh, English translation. Um, in my book that will be coming out here in the next couple of months, uh, I specifically, of course, she's dealing with all of the laws. Uh, I hone in on all of the slave laws in particular, and I provide oh. them in an appendix and translation oh, oh, oh. with, okay. with commentary. Um, oh. and then I, I, I obviously would be impossible to, uh, or at least very, very cumbersome for the reader to bring together any mention of slave in, you know, the rest of the genres, but I go through a lot of contracts and a lot of court cases and some narratives and uh, where I think it's pertinent. And I give yeah. those in translation and commentary as well, just so okay. it's all sort of in one place. Okay. So let's, let, let, let's get on to the, the, the juicy stuff. I mean, can you, can you say something about like, how was slavery broadly different or the same as what we're used to thinking about? Most of us, um, uh, at least in the U.S. and in England as well, um, in Britain as well, think of slavery in terms of what was going on in the 17th to the 19th mm -hmm. century, where it was uh, it was racially based and it was uh, was uh, was a horrible institution where people were captured and forced to uh, be enslaved and taken to a different country. And uh, so, just can you tell us some things that would make it kind of like that and not like that in uh, in the world that you look at? Yeah. So one of the things that um, often comes up in, you know, if, if you go watch uh, someone like Frank Turek uh, or another like big name apologist debate this topic, uh, one of the first thing that, things that they'll say is, well, you know, let's just get it right, you know, out there that it was nothing like slavery in the antebellum South. Um, and my response to that is, yeah, it depends on what you mean. Mm -hmm. uh, because what he means by that is think about what we know about what happened, right? Think about the atrocities. Think about um, all the horrific things that were done to slaves. But what he doesn't mean by that is let's make a comparison between the laws that mm -hmm. were uh, on, you know, on the books, you know, or in existence in the ancient Near East and those that were on the books in the antebellum South. When you okay. make that comparison, it's a little scary. Okay. Um, and I, I write about this in the book uh, because the laws in the antebellum South in many ways are very, very similar hmm. to what we see uh, you know, in, in the ancient Near East and in the Hebrew Bible in particular. Uh, so just you know, f f very, uh, as, a, as a broad, maybe a broad example, um, that the treatment of slaves, you know, in, in the ancient Near East, they're wrestling with this, this tension between where well, you have a slave, if he's a debt slave, he's there for however many years. In the Bible, it's six. In the laws of Hammurabi, he's there for three years. Um, a, if he's a, 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 a debt slave? Yes. I thought you said dead slave, and I was wondering oh, no. how that works. <laughs> so, so explain what a debt slave is. Yeah, so debt slaves uh, are people that have come into this position uh, of slavery, the status of slavery, because of a debt that they owe. And the slavery is contingent upon the repayment of that debt. And that's really all that it means. So the difference really between a chattel slave and a debt slave, at least in uh, what, what keeps them there, is that debt. So a chattel slave is just a slave that his slavery or their, her slavery is not contingent upon the repayment of a debt. 
So wait, uh, so so I owe you ten thousand bucks, and I can't pay you. That's right. And one way to deal with that is for for me to do I enslave myself to you, or do you uh, demand my slavery, or how does it? Work? It depends. Um, so a lot of times these things are just contractually, uh, you know, these are contractual obligations, um, and that would I think be the, sort of the common way uh, that you know I, I say, look, you know, yeah, yeah I'm going to loan you this money, and if you default on it, it's within my legal right to take you as my debt slave. I see. Uh, I see. I see. Um, yeah. How are you and, supposed to pay it off? Well, it's this. So this was the uh, this was the interesting thing about the law is that you know that the under I guess normal circumstances it would be okay. Well, you know, so you you, you owe me that money and I take you as a debt slave. Uh, well, you start to work it off, uh, but then all of a sudden I'm charging you interest. I'm charging you room and board. Like I'm I'm charging you these things and all you know now these things that you you can't pay it off by your work, the value of your work fast enough yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. As, as you're incurring the debt. And so ultimately people like that would be converted into chattel slavery because they I just, see. they okay. couldn't pay it off. And so the law took means, uh, took, you know, took steps uh, in the ancient Near East and, and in the Hebrew Bible to say, okay, look, you know, if you read the laws of Hammurabi, if somebody becomes a debt slave, they're going to work for three years and it's done. Interest, you know, room and board, whatever else you're thinking about tacking on there, it's all okay. covered. In, okay. In that okay. three-year period, and in the yeah. Hebrew Bible, it's six years. Okay. Um, but the tension that they that they faced was that, you know, theoretically, a slave could come in and just sort of sit there, right? And he said, "Well, I just you know, got to run out the clock." Um, and so, you know, how the, the way that they're thinking about this is, well, how do I motivate my slave to do the work that he needs to do? Um, and so, if you read something like Proverbs twenty-nine. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's slaves are not motivated by words alone, right? Because they'll hear right. and not understand. Um, and so that you, you see in passages, and we can talk about them, but you see in passages in the Hebrew Bible and, and of course, in the wider ancient Near East where corporal punishment, this is the way that they did it. They beat them in order to motivate them. And this yeah. is the tension uh, that, that was, you know, felt in the antebellum South as well as judges would sit back and they'd say, well, look, masters have to be able to beat their slaves, but the slave is a human. And so, like, how do we keep the slave from being abused and murdered? And so there were laws on the books, many laws on the books that actually developed as you approach the Civil War. They became more humane, where mm -hmm. it was like, look, you, you can't just you can't just abuse if you the law would say if you if you beat your slave to death, it's it's like you if you murder your slave, it's like you've murdered a free white person. Okay. And those are oh, sorry, you get that ahead. in the ancient Near East as well. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's so if you look at. Um, you know, that passage uh, in Exodus 21, or if you look in, again, I always go to the laws of Hammurabi because they're just so clear there. But if uh, if a master uh, has a, a, a debt slave um, or a pledge that's taken uh, because of a debt and they die natural causes while they're there, there's no punishment, right? Because it's just the way things go. But if they die because of a beating or because of abuse, then... Uh, if if it's uh if the pledge is uh, the child of the debtor well then the the child of the creditor is killed um no. if it's a daughter and the daughter because so it's a, a form of lex talionis um so it was a serious thing to, to yeah 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 to abuse yeah, yeah. or to beat a debt slave uh to death so you sounds like i mean you're you're referring to both the code of hammurabi which is this babylonian law code mm -hmm. and the the old testament uh hebrew bible in the same breath mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it sounds like you're saying that they're very comparable in their understandings is that yeah would that be fair to say yeah i have a i have a chapter where i, I essentially just go through and pull all of the, the laws about slavery that um you know deal with the same the same issue of slavery uh from the various law collections and in the hebrew bible and just do comparative analysis. And I, I did this in another book with rape and adultery laws. Um, mm. And it's just one thing that you find over and over again is that you know, the, the Hebrew Bible is an ancient Near Eastern text. And it's it's approaching things in the same way. It's mm. it's giving similar uh, legal justifications for the, the way that things are done. Uh, it comes to similar conclusions. Huh. Uh, in the ways that it deals with it. So, yeah, huh. I mean, it, it's really on par. That's interesting, because I think most people just assume that the Bible is at least somewhat different from, from its environment. I mean, Israel's supposed to be a special people, right? They got their special law. They This is what makes them distinctive. But at least when it comes to slavery, you're saying, well, actually, it's kind of 
pretty much the same? Is it? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of places, uh, for example, in the Deuteronomic Law in Deuteronomy 15 or in the Holiness Code in Leviticus 25, uh, when it talks about slavery, it seems to add these stipulations that um, uh, are are God dependent. <laughs> so, for example, okay. in Deuteronomy 15, it says when you when you release your is now they're for Israelites. It's not for everybody, just for Israelites. But when you release your Israelite debt slave after the six years, you're not supposed to just send him out empty-handed. You're supposed to give him a bunch of provisions. But then the text says, like essentially, God's going to take care of that economic um problem that it that that situation would create and so it's sort of this utopian idealistic you know way of setting so like scholars would say yeah this this, this probably wasn't practiced because i mean uh -huh. like, you right, know, right. you'd have to assume supernatural intervention for that <laughs> right right right, right. But, but really outside of that part like they're they're just it i, I would I, I've been thinking about doing like a, a a game show where I I have contestants come on and and read ancient Near Eastern laws and read biblical laws and see who uh -huh. can pick out which one's which because I yeah, think yeah. it would be a very difficult yeah, thing yeah. to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Josh, could you say something about uh, like who the enslaved were? I mean, debtors, but I mean, you know, we 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 tend to think of it as race based. Sure. And I frequently get this question. You know, how about in the Bible? Is it race based? Can you say something about that? Yeah. So just on broadly, concepts of race and ethnicity uh, are very complicated in the ancient world. Uh, so like, you know, delving into that would probably be put everybody to sleep. But, um, you know, the, the, the way that the people that were enslaved, uh, be it by debt or chattel, or even as we would categorize them today as sex slaves, it, it's not uh, it's not based on their race. Right. There is a concept of foreignness. And foreigners uh, often uh, will have like different different laws or different punishments or different levels of severity if something is done to them. But it's 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 not because of a particular like skin color uh, or you know feature in that sense. It's just that they're from you know they're from a a, a different city uh, uh, or a but different how do country. People, how do people? So I mean, the Roman world. I think I think like lots and lots of these slaves were um prisoners of war mm. is that is that the case in the ancient Near East as well yeah <clears throat> so seth richardson has just done uh, some research on this and uh, a seriologist uh from university of chicago and he's he's done some research in this um i don't know if he's at chicago now i probably shouldn't have said that but uh he was for a while um but he's written uh pretty extensively on slavery during the early second millennium and there are certainly uh, slaves as prisoners of war, but it, it, it does seem like debt slavery is sort of the, the major uh, avenue uh, 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 by which people enter into slavery and then ultimately into chattel slavery because, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of times these debts, uh, you know, don't get paid or pledges get converted into chattel, as to, into chattel slavery. And um, so, uh, again, you have it. But I, d I don't think it's the primary source when you when I actually get down to the documentation. Yeah. Well, if not for debt, how, how do other people become chattel slaves? Yeah, you, certainly people can, are born into slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you can see that, uh, again, both in the ancient Near East and in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so if you look at something like Exodus 21, 2 to 6, uh, you, you have uh, a male slave who uh, becomes a debt slave for six years to his Israelite master. And he, <clears throat> when he's given a wife or if he's given a wife and they have children, the wife and the children uh, are chattel slaves. And so that that child is called uh, a house born slave, you know, a child born uh, into the house. And th there is no debt upon which his, his or her slave is contingent. Okay. Um, and of course that man could volunteer to become a chattel slave. Uh, you know, women that are sold into slavery as uh, concubines or slave wives, they're, they're chattel slaves. Uh, they have a slightly elevated status, but their, their, their slavery is not contingent upon the repayment of a debt. Okay. So, so let me, um, the, the, the one passage that uh, I think some people may be familiar with, if they've read the 10 commandments and like kept reading to the next chapter, right. <laughs> most people don't, <laughs> most people don't read the 10 commandments, but if they did, right. if they got to chapter 21, there's this very disturbing for me, it's always been the most disturbing slave law in the Bible. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they're worse that I haven't, uh, don't remember very well, but uh, let me read it to you, to, to the audience. So this is Exodus chapter 21 verses seven and following. 
When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slave do. If she does not please her master who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt unfairly with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall uh, deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out without debt, without payment of money. Okay. Uh, so this sounds like, uh, so I've got a daughter and I sell her to the guy who lives next door to be his wife or to be his sex slave or to be his mistress or what. And, yeah. and if, if she, he's not satisfied with presumably, you know, how that's going <laughs> probably sexually, I assume mm. then, uh, then there are rules about you know, what to do then. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, really? Yeah. You can sell your daughter. <laughs> this is, this is the Bible, by the way, we're not talking about something, right, right. <laughs> we're talking about something off in Babylon or something. This is like, right. this is right there right after the 10 commandments. So could you like unpack this for us? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the, you know, this, this, uh, section in 21, seven through 11 is following that initial set of, uh, laws in two to six about the male debt slave. Um, and when you said she should not go free as the male slaves do, that's in direct, uh, contradiction to, what had just been laid out for male slaves. Um, and so oddly enough, and this is gonna sound far more horrific perhaps to our modern ears, th this law is supposed to be a protection for mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Um, and so the situation that's being described here is you have a man, he goes into debt, and in order to satisfy that debt, he can sell his daughter. Um, and in so doing, she enters into uh, probably what is equivalent to concubinage. Um, and so in that sense, uh, what happens to her obviously very quickly is that uh, he has sexual intercourse with her and in their eyes that devalued her, right? Because uh, they, they valued uh, the virginity of a woman and so that virginity has been taken and so now, um, essentially her resale value has diminished, right? You've driven her off the lot is the way that they viewed that, uh, which is understandably horrific to our ears as it, as it should be. Um, and so now the law comes in and says, okay, look, you can't just, she doesn't just go free, meaning that you can't just get rid of her, right? You can't just put her back out um, because you, you've devalued her. And so uh, if she's displeasing, uh, you can't just sell her as a slave. She doesn't just drop back down to that status of slave proper, able to be sold. Um, you know, you have to allow the family to redeem her. Uh, if if uh, she isn't displeasing, but you take another wife, uh, ostensibly like another, like slave wife is probably what's intended there in the text. Um, you can't just, you know, say, well, it was, you know, nice knowing you have fun sitting in the corner. Um, you have to continue to provide for her the the things that 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 you provided in the beginning otherwise she goes free but i mean apologists will if you can believe it will will bring this up which is so strange to me that then like that's one of the ones that i just want to sort of like pretend's not there in a debate if i could um but they'll bring it up and they'll, they'll tout it out as look look at the provisions that are being given being given and the responses yeah, but so so let's assume in this scenario that you're okay for some reason with a woman being a daughter being sold uh um and and it, she's being sold because of her sexual uh capabilities right and uh in the same way that the sexual capabilities were being used by the male slave in verses two to six it's just when you use a man's sexual capabilities he's not tarnished in their eyes so the, these these provisions don't have to be put in place to protect him he can just be set free huh. um but like if if the if the master says yeah i'm good with her i'm going to yeah. take another wife or another concubine but but i'm going to continue to provide her with food and clothing and these other necessities she has to stay yeah yeah um <laughs> Okay, so, so this yeah, I mean, is, but that's what it says. That's what it is. This is problematic all over the map. I mean, yes, my starting God. Starting with the man who wants to sell his daughter. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, but all right. So, look, you've mentioned several times apologists. And so I'm not familiar with this thing. It sounds like you debate apologists. They're, are they, are, 
about slave about are they saying something like you know the bible has a positive view of slavery <laughs> or that people who didn't serve as slaves or what i don't understand you're talking about christian apologists who are trying yeah. to defend the bible yeah. right yeah so i'm not familiar with debates about slavery so could you just kind of summarize <laughs> what what even Neither this is I. <laughs> but yeah. now it's apparently the thing that i do um, okay yeah right yeah, so there, there are essentially two approaches uh to biblical slavery the christian apologists will take one is josh you don't understand it's not slavery like we think about. It's actually like the kindler, gentler form of slavery. You know, what else were they supposed to do? That that, that approach to sort of whitewashing yes. uh, the practice. The other, I think, more nuanced, um, still bad, but more nuanced view is to say, yes, you know, um, God, God allowed slavery in the Old Testament. Um, but as we see in passages like Matthew 19, he also allowed for men to put away their wives for any reason. And so, but but then he 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 you know sort of ups the ante, right? And says, you know, but from the beginning it was not so. And so, like it's 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 almost as like there's this, I call it like the Matthew 19 principle that they try to employ. And they say, well, you know, uh Moses allowed these things because of the hardness of their hearts. And if divorce was one, well, slavery must have been one. And Ooh. so God is just sort of, you know, slowly working them out, condescending to them where they are, but then slowly working them out. And and we I'd love to actually get your opinion on this. Um, but where they where they end up going is saying, what well, see, they're like in the New Testament, Jesus and the writers of the New Testament, they're ultimately condemning slavery. And I go, Huh, really? Where? <laughs> and really? the passages that always come up are Galatians 3 28, 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, and of course the book of Philemon. And so <laughs> I go I go oh, through boy. this in my book, but I'd love to get uh, you oh, know. Oh no, your, are those misreadings of those texts? Oh, my, oh my god, really? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, for first, first of all, that explanation that they're giving sounds to me anti-Semitic. Mm. They're saying that those Jews had hard hearts and that you know. But then when Christians came along, they took care of it. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. What else is new, though? What yeah, else is whatever. new? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. Well, you know, finally. Go okay. Yeah. We could spend a whole episode on this, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Gal Galatians 3 says that in Christ, there's neither uh, male nor female, not uh, slave or free, not Jew or Greek. And that's uh, what that means. I, you know, I just wish people would read things in context. <laughs> yes. But but in, in its context, what that means is that everybody equally gets salvation yep. in Christ. Everybody in Christ. equally gets salvation. And so uh, a free person doesn't get a better salvation than a slave and a man than a woman. But it's quite clear. Paul sees there are very big differences between men and women in this yes, world. Exactly. Paul doesn't tell men to go around with head coverings, for example. Right. He, there are big differences. And there's no place in the New Testament where it says, free your slaves. Right. If they read Philemon like that, they're just reading it into Philemon. I actually think, because, no, it, it, I really, uh, you know, I think if you read Philemon carefully, what Paul is at, so for those who don't know, uh, Onesimus is a slave who was owned by somebody named Philemon, who Paul knows. Paul had converted Philemon to be a follower of Jesus. And Paul's off in jail someplace, and his slave, the slave of Philemon, Onesimus, has found him in jail. And Paul is writing to Philemon in order to tell him to like cut him a break for whatever wrong thing he did for you. And so he's, he's because now Onesimus has converted. It's not clear whether it's like a convenient conversion so that he can have Paul on his side, or it's not clear about that. But Paul never says, set him free. Right. <laughs> at all. And Paul, what Paul says, in fact, is, you know how much you owe me. And so like you, you, you should consider telling Philemon, you should consider doing a favor for me. I think he wants Onesimus to serve him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, and so it is not about freeing slaves. I, I, yeah. Okay. I didn't know about these apologies going around trying to claim this kind of thing because oh, it's yeah. completely wrong. I do know that at the museum of the Bible in Washington, DC, I, I went there to kind of check it out and they have a whole display trying to show how the Bible is what brought liberation for slaves in America. And I thought that was astounding. Really? Yes. Yeah. Huh. I mean, in the South, at least you know where I live, um, slave owners, used the bible to justify yes. slavery they weren't yeah. trying to set them free yeah. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting to me about this is that what what apologists will use if they if they talk about this is they'll talk about the slave bible 
Uh, and I suspect there was like a version of that there at the Museum of the Bible, but it's they've edited out, you know, the slave Bible essentially takes out, I, I haven't looked at it, but like most, if not all of the Old Testament and major sections of the New, I think is at least major <laughs> yeah. sections of the Old Testament. And so they'll say, well, wait a minute, like Leviticus 25, 44 to 46, you know, the, the passage that says, as for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may get them from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. You may also purchase slaves from the temporary residents that are in the land among you and you, they, they will become your property. You can pass them on as inheritance to your children after you and they make them serve forever, but you can never do this to your fellow Israelites. Well, when you bring that up, they'll say, well, wait a minute, the slave Bible deletes that. It's not in there. So why would they delete that, Josh, if, that, if, if that's supposed to mean slavery? And I say, well, because it's part of the Pentateuch, which has as its main theme the exodus <laughs> it's, it's, right. it's deliverance from slavery for israel right Th that's not a story that you want in there so you they're not going to go through there and like you know with a scalpel and like say well we can leave this one in here but let's take this whole site no they're just going to say get rid of that whole section like, so it what just is, doesn't, that's, that's what's the slave bible what 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 actually is it I'm, it's apparently a bible that was uh uh like slaves were allowed to have this particular version at some time. I haven't done research into <laughs> so it. So the owners, the owners gave the slaves one to make it look like slavery wasn't. Yeah, okay. Right, right. So if you uh, take yeah, out the you know the Exodus, you take out these things about freedom uh, for Israel. It's, it's like oh, well, you know that. I mean, that but, sounds to me like the Jefferson Bible, right? You take out yeah. all the miracles of Jesus, and they, right. then you say Jesus didn't do any miracles. See, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Now, I don't see any miracles in this Bible. So. Yeah. Have you ever wondered where the New Testament Gospels really came from? Were the books actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as everyone seems to say? The answers to these questions may surprise you. In fact, what you discover may challenge everything you thought you knew about the Gospels. If you're ready to learn the historical truth, then you won't want to miss Bart Ehrman's free webinar, Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? In this 50-minute talk with Q&A, you'll learn answers to some of the most intriguing questions surrounding the Gospels' authorship, such as, why did early Christians say the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John if they're anonymous? What's the best evidence that the Gospels were written by the Apostles? Were the Apostles of Jesus educated well enough to write books? And last, if the Apostles did not write the Gospels, who did? And where did they get their information? Don't miss your chance to uncover the truth behind the Gospels. Sign up now for free lifetime access to Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John at barterman.com forward slash authors. Thank you. All right. So, well, you know, the thing is that um, I, it, it opens up a bigger issue, really, the, this, this whole discussion about slavery in the Bible. People, especially uh, Bible-believing Christians, do appeal to the Bible for their ethics. Uh, and it's very interesting as an outsider to look and to see what they use the Bible to support and to condemn. Uh, and and what's what particularly interesting is usually what they choose has nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> Another, I mean, just as, just as an example, a kind of very common example right now is that people are uh, uh, people are uh, protesting also, you know, about all sorts of abortion laws in America, mm -hmm. and the the religious right is condemning condemning abortion. And I'm not taking a stand on whether that's you know what position that is here. I'm I'm just saying that you know you have. Christians saying the Bible opposes abortion, and this is a major argument of theirs. And the thing is, the Bible doesn't talk about abortion <laughs> ever, anywhere. Doesn't mention. I mean, there are a few passages that relate to abortion, mm -hmm. but the passages that relate to abortion are pretty clear that the biblical authors who at least write these passages don't consider an unborn child a human being. That's correct. That's <laughs> I correct. Mean, you know, and so uh, including a passage in, in Exodus and a, mm -hmm. one in Numbers, and then there mm -hmm. are passages. So I'm not going to get into all of that, but I'm just saying they're using the Bible to make it say something it doesn't say. Yeah. But then when they use the Bible to to say it's the opposite sometimes, too. They say the, just the opposite, of the, like the Bible condemns slavery. The Bible doesn't condemn slavery. Yeah, I where? Mean, <laughs> 
what, what, so, so why are you saying that it condemns? I mean, so, yeah. uh, all right. So uh, do you, I mean, I, so you, you recently, you've edited, uh, this, this book, uh, atheist, uh, what is it? Atheist introduction to the old Testament or. Oh, the atheist handbook to the old Testament. Handbook to the old Testament. So do you, so I assume that means you're an atheist. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but at least you know the atheist point of view. So what what do you make of it about this use of the Bible for modern ethics? In other words, when you deal with slavery, just about everybody today, not every I, I know people who don't agree with this, yeah. but most everybody thinks that slavery is a very, very bad thing. They think the Bible is a very, very good thing. And so the Bible can't condone can't can't right. condone slavery. Uh but you know, what do you do with a book that actually does condone something that you're ethically opposed to? And how do you use this book for ethics then? Yeah. You know, John Collins wrote a book on this, uh, I think back in 2019. And I would encourage everybody to to, to read it. It's a, it's a pretty easy read, but it's called What Are Biblical Values? Yeah. And, um, you know, he goes through a lot of these things, slavery, abortion, violence, rape, adultery, these sorts of things. And like to sort of, talk for a moment about um, the abortion issue. Like there, there's only one ancient Near Eastern law that I know about that speaks to abortion specifically, and that is the Middle Assyrian laws, uh, A53, which says if a woman aborts her, her unborn child, aborts her fetus, uh, she's killed and staked out in front of her house. Whoa, right? really? So it's, yeah, it's the, it's the only law that I know of um, huh. that specifically speaks to that. And when you come to the Hebrew Bible, like you mentioned two passages, Numbers 5, Exodus 21, and in both of those cases, uh, you know, in, in Numbers 5, even though the text, I don't think the text is, I don't think the fetus is in the mind of the writers um, or, or of the editor, I, I think that if you hold to a fundamentalist evangelical viewpoint of the text, it's a, an abortive process uh, yeah. because the text is saying that there's a seminal omission and that uh, the woman who uh, has engaged is guilty of engaging in um, extramarital sex, uh, her, uh, she, her, her womb essentially fails, right? Her reproductive organs fail. And so uh, if there is a pregnancy, which, you know, if this thing was carried out in any way, which they would say that it was, um, most likely that it would result in abortions. Like, I mean, there's just no yeah. question about that. And this is a divinely um, prescribed uh, solution to deal if you're if you if somebody suspects their wife of having uh, committed adultery. There's yeah. this ritual they go through in order to see, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. And and but, people should note about that that there is no test for the unfaithful husband. No, that's right. That's right. So, well, no, I mean, so, yeah. so but this is the whole problem with. I mean. You know, the Bible is filled with ethical prescriptions, and many of them are ones that most of us would still endorse. Uh, many of them are. Many of the ones are ones that we simply uh, would be completely opposed to, and many of them just like we wouldn't even think about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we don't really think too much about whether we should wear a shirt that's made of two different kinds of fabric. Right. You know, but it's condemned. I mean, it's condemned. Yeah. Uh, and not it's not condemned long after the uh, it's condemned for a male to lie with a male. That's right. But you you pick, you know, you pick one thing that mm -hmm. you you ride on the streets for, and the other thing you don't even think about. But there, That's right. it's in the same Bible, and so it seems to me that it's kind of problematic to take an ancient text and pretend that it applies to twenty first century America without remainder. It seems yeah. like you everybody picks and chooses. That's, I guess that's my point. Everybody and, picks and chooses, and you have to have some reason for why you pick and choose. It can't just be because this one I like and this one I don't like. <laughs> it's it's interesting to me because I, I spend a lot of time on, uh, like a lot of my free time on social media, um, arguing with people, debating with people about these, these things. And what I'm finding is uh, I obviously much prefer uh, the type of Christian who will begin with their current ethical system, mm -hmm. their progressive ethical system. They'll say things to themselves like, I know that it's wrong for a virgin girl who is raped by a man to be forced to marry that man, right? I know that that's wrong, so I'm gonna start there. Or I know that slavery is wrong. Um, I know that cutting off uh, somebody's hand is wrong. Right? I, and, and so then they go back to the biblical texts in light of that and try to maneuver around 
uh, what the text actually says. I much prefer that person. Let's just yeah. be clear. Yeah. Because there are lots of people growing numbers in a scary way uh, of people that say, well, I want to be consistent. So if I go back and I see that slavery is endorsed in uh, the Hebrew Bible, well, maybe we should look into bringing it back. Yeah. And if it says here that um, a child should be stoned, who am oh, I? We should, maybe really? we should be bringing that Seriously? back. Oh, I, I, I had a conversation yesterday I was involved in. What? Um, <laughs> so this is a very real thing. I, I think people need to be aware of that because this this idea of like it, it being a good thing to be consistent, it can lead to very scary results. Well, because no, that would be scary, yeah. If you're coming to the text and you're saying, I believe that this is a divinely inspired, inerrant text handed down by God on high, um, and I believe that we have the correct interpretation of it because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, I know. No, I know. But that, you know, I mean, uh, there are going to be... Uh, they're going to be crazy people no matter what. Did yeah. did you you know that book? What was that book that came out some years ago? Is that a really good book called uh, uh, A Year of Living Biblically? Is that what it was mm. called? Do you know this? Mm. This yeah. is a guy. He, he wasn't. Uh, he was Jewish, but I don't think he was like. Uh, I don't. He just thought it'd be fun to try and actually implement the biblical laws for a year and oh see God. what it was like. <laughs> it's a very funny book, but it's yeah. it has a real point too because yeah. it's a uh, filer. Somebody filer. Okay. I uh, wrote this book, and uh, but uh, so pe that might be something for people to look at. But I don't think. Most most people on this listening to this podcast, at least as far as we've gotten now on this one, are going to be, uh, you know, wanting to stone their children to death. There'll be a different group of people, yeah. uh, luckily. So, Hope so. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I just have one one question to close, which is more on kind of the, the scholarship end of things, um, which is that when um, when I was working as a research grunt for the New Revised Standard Version translation mm -hmm. of the Bible back in the 80s, uh, there was a big issue in the New Testament, and there still is. There was a big issue with the recent re-release of the new the NRSV, the New mm -hmm. Revised Standard Version, about what to do in the New Testament when you have the word slave. Um, uh, slaves are referred to. Their, it, slavery itself is never condemned. Paul gives instructions to slaves. Um, about how they're to, and in Pauline letters, how they're to obey their masters. Um, uh, it's presupposed uh, as an institution. Uh, Jesus tells parables about slaves. Uh, but the feeling of the committee uh, in this last rendition appears to have been that the word slave conjures up so many wrong ideas in the modern world because of our, um, of our experience uh, in, in America that um, it conjures up the wrong idea, and so it's better not to use the word. And so they try to come up with other words, and they'll, they'll say they'll use like servant maybe with a footnote. Uh, you know, Greek means slave. Um, I'm not a big fan of that no. view. <laughs> I think that people need to realize uh, that it means slave, and and it there are actually people and some biblical authors get purchased off of it. Paul Paul calls himself a slave of Christ, and he uh, and understanding what he means by that is really important for understanding Paul. If you say servant, it just ain't the same. No. So, do you have an opinion about uh, slavery? I mean, th there's a, there are good arguments because you know people who are um, you know African Americans who have who read their Bible and um, realize the kind of the history of slavery and and how many of those issues have never been resolved and yeah. have created huge, huge problems uh, are really, um, you know, they have a good argument that, you know, you shouldn't put something in scripture that can be used as a kind of a sanction for what's happened to us and what still is kind of happening to us. And in fact, really happening to us in some place. So they, they prefer, you know, yeah, not, I'm not saying every, African American. I'm saying that sure, sure. this is the argument made by some, by some scholars and that it's better than not to use the, the term slave. So could you just give a opinion, opinion yeah, on that? I mean, I, I would say that um, the problem that I see with uh, sort of whitewashing the term and trying to smooth it out um, is that I, I certainly understand the argument, right? From a uh, <clears throat> you know, from the standpoint of uh, people people trying to use it again uh, to, to to as you say to sanction. 
but the, the the problem is that I think if we forget the past, we repeat it. And this is what's so dangerous in these online conversations that I have is that if people don't recognize that the laws in the Hebrew Bible are eerily reminiscent of the laws that were on the books in the antebellum South, if you forget that, if you don't realize that, the arguments that people make, and I mean big name Christian apologists, the arguments that they make to defend the laws about biblical slavery, you can mm -hmm. make the same arguments for the laws in the antebellum South. And yeah. that is frightening to me. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Because you could say, well, I mean, gosh, like Bart, what else? What what I mean, what else are they supposed how else are they supposed to pay off this debt? And and what else are they once they're a slave? What else are you supposed to do to motivate them? I mean, and look, yeah. they can't they can't murder them, they can't abuse them. Even the <laughs> biblical texts themselves, if you read Jeremiah 34 and Nehemiah 5, you'll see that even according, even if it's not a historical account, just the narrative itself tells you they're not listening to the laws. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, I I just it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it scares me to think about these baby steps that people sometimes don't realize they're taking to repeating the past. And while I certainly understand not wanting to give um, someone license through utilizing you know, a text, if they're doing that, if they're using that text for license, they're going to find, I suspect, that license anyway. Yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. it's more important to say, no, this is what the text says. We need to be absolutely imperative uh, to not defend these things and to make, you know, to repeat uh, this, 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 this set of atrocities and not defend these practices, but instead recognize we're in a different place uh, ethically and morally. And, and we need to understand the same way that we don't read the Epic of Gilgamesh and take everything that it says about how to treat people um, and make a, somehow make it the basis for our morality. We need to do the same thing with the biblical texts, which are ancient Near Eastern texts and say, Hey, as a product of its time, we understand why they did it, but we don't want to repeat that. Yeah, yeah, uh, so yeah. we don't understand what it actually said in its context and not do it yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, thanks, Josh. It's been great talking with you. Uh, and thank you all for uh, listening to this uh, special edition of the podcast. Uh, next week, uh, I will be back with uh, uh, with Megan. <laughs> so we're keeping it in the household. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck. With What's the book? What are the books called, by the way? If people uh, so the uh, the one that will be coming out soon is uh, Did the Old Testament Endorse Slavery? Uh, second edition. Uh, okay. So it's, it's th okay. there is a, a current edition out now. This one will be greatly uh, revised and expanded. Did the Old Testament endorse slavery? Okay, right. very good. Okay, great. Okay, thanks so much, Josh. Thank you, Bart. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.